Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Get in the Garage. We're a music podcast. For music lovers. We've got a great show planned for you today, as always, but before we begin... Please remember to like and comment and subscribe and share this podcast with all your friends. Rate us on Apple Podcasts as well. I don't know if you can do ratings on Google Podcasts or any of the other things, but like and uh, rate on those as well. If you can, leave a review. And also, share with... Uh, someone that <laughs> serves lunch in uh, your school lunch. A lunch, a lunch person. A lunch person. Our audience this week is only 16 and under. Yes. <laughs> uh, people in high school, tell your uh, person that serves you lunch at lunchtime. I do not want to uh, only categorize this to the lunch lady. There are uh, males that work in this field as well. Yes, lunch hey, people. They work in colleges, too. Yes, uh, colleges. Oh, that's true. Thank you. So someone's serving you lunch at your college or high school. Tell them about our podcast. I feel like they need to know. Those are the people that have long hours to listen to things. Tell them. Have some more sloppy joes. It's like, have you heard about Get in the Garage? <laughs> have you heard about Get in the Garage? Anyway, let's roll the music. Alex, can you cue up that? Uh, can you cue up that music for cue. us? <laughs> cue the music, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. 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 This is music news. This is music news. Uh, anybody want to kick us off? R.I.P. Yes, thank you. R.I.P.s. There are a couple this week. Jazz legend Wayne Shorter, 89 years old, died March 2nd. Jazz saxophone player with uh, the Jazz Messengers, Miles Davis's second great quintet, Weather Report, Herbie Hancock, solo work, um, possibly in my opinion, the only player who ever made the soprano sax sound good. Um, yeah, a long time, great jazz legend, composer, arranger, player, um, 89 years old, Wayne Shorter. Rest in peace. Another rest in peace. We have Gary Rosington. Rosington? Rosington? He was the guitar player for Leonard Skinner. Also, he survived that plane crash. The plane crash that like half a letter to Skinner died in. He was one of the survivors. Wow! And went on to continue playing with uh, with Leonard Skinner and then uh, Jimmy Van Sant, Ronnie's yes. younger brother, ended up being the uh, the lead singer. I would also like to point out he is the slide guitar solo you are hearing on Freebird. Oh yes, rest there you in have peace, it. brother. Yes, so rest in peace. Uh, uh, I got one more for you. Yes. Uh, also, rest in peace to uh, legendary producer Spot. Uh, died at seventy two years old. Mm. Uh, Spot was the producer for many of the hardcore bands on the SST label. Um, just some albums real fast. The Misfits, Earth AD, uh, all of Black Flag's discography pretty much. Uh, the Minutemen, um, their earlier albums. Tons of great stuff. The Descendants, the list goes on. St. Vitus, he was a legendary producer. Meat Puppets. Um, and his work is on so many classic classic records um check some of them out i just named uh, a ton of bands and when their work is littered with his production and uh, a real big loss and a real influence in the way that punk and hardcore was recorded for the first time in a real way so rest in peace spot yeah rest in peace to him do we have any more rest in pieces all yeah. right that wraps it up uh i do have some interesting well not interesting news but news that i read that i was like you know what Right on, Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you might be wondering, what does that have to do with music? So, Jamie Lee Curtis was on, I think, the Today Show, one of those shows, and she was being interviewed, and she is flying the flag for matinee shows. She was talking about how, for example, a band that she would love to see would be a band called Coldplay. You might know them, probably know them, but how, you know, if Coldplay had a concert at 9 p.m., she doesn't want to go see a concert at 9 p.m., and that chances are that that show probably has an opener and you probably wouldn't see Coldplay until late at night. She said, let's make matinees a thing. I would love to see Coldplay at 1 p.m. So I think mm. that's a great idea. I, I also agree with that sentiment. I strongly agree. Um, comedians do it all the time, two shows in one day. Um, I could also get uh, artist burnout, but if you did every other day, one show may be a matinee and the next show is a late show and the next night, that would be a cool idea, but something I would also be down for, I like to sleep. You know why they won't do it, though? Why? Nighttime is travel time. 
And if you do a matinee show, your people got to get there at like 4 a.m. to s- start setting up stuff. Yep. Oh, so yeah. So it just can't be done unless you are a band that has the luxury to space two days in between each show. Yeah, right, right. Or if it's like a home game, you know what I mean? So like if Coldplay's playing yeah. like the Royal Albert Hall or something like that, you could probably do like a, I don't know that they two live shows in England, in but, you thing. know. Yeah. This idea was once used uh, to curb violence at hardcore shows at CBGB's mm-hmm. where they held the shows on Sunday during right. the matinees so yeah. that it was the daytime, it was less apt to be violent and yeah. all that fun stuff. <laughs> also, a quick shout out to Willamantic Records in Willamantic, Connecticut, because they have Sunday matinee shows all the time. So if you're in the Connecticut area and you want to catch a cool show and uh it's a sunday afternoon look up willamantic records they're always having a bunch of good shows sunday afternoons agree worth a check out uh jeffrey do you have anything yes k-pop group black pink became the most streamed female band on spotify with nine billion streams that is crazy awesome news nine billion streams Holy crap. Very interesting. Uh, And this on National uh, Women's Day, Women's Month. It's the Women's Day in Women's Month. Um, Women should be celebrated more in our culture. Um, But uh, they played a bunch of women on the radio today at work as well, which was uh, a great uh, breath of fresh air in my view. Uh, But, yeah, that is really exciting news. So they are the most streamed artist. Female band. Female band. Okay. That's That's a high feat. One yeah. billion streams. Nine. Nine billion streams. Nine billion streams. God Think about damn. that. <laughs> that is. That's crazy. That is large. Right on. K-pop is alive and well, man. Uh, For sure. I have Ticketmaster news. Oh, let's let's go. Uh, the saga continues. I told you about Dick Blumenthal and the senators that were railing against Live Nation and Ticketmaster. Uh, Amy Klobuchar is the other senator there. Uh, Amy Klobuchar took the lead and decided to send. Uh, a letter of recommendation to the uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice, and is recommending that they look into maybe criminally charging um, Ticketmaster in some sort of way and um, further investigating what is going on with Ticketmaster because they also believe that Ticketmaster is sending out um, some of their goons in some kind of way to uh, abuse other lower ticketers uh, or people that sell tickets out there so that they are using their power to also like really illegally, uh, you know, go after these smaller corporations. Um, because of this, uh, Ticketmaster got together with Universal Music Group and a bunch of other like artist management groups. And they got together and they signed a letter that they're going to essentially fix this problem in-house and come up with an idea to stop ticket scalping uh, and all all things of that nature. Um, this seems to me as a consumer and um, someone that's been reporting on this, I guess, or like telling you about this for months, that that seems disingenuous to me and that they are trying to solve the problem on the inside so they don't really have to solve the problem and they further won't get looked at by the Department of Justice. Um, So that came out today that they signed all those things and amidst all of this going on, Live Nation crashed again um, the other day during the Eurovision Song Contest ticket sales. Uh, People overseas were trying to buy tickets for the Eurovision Song Contest. The site crashed just like the Taylor Swift did. It did not crash for nearly as long. This was only less than an hour, I believe, but still they're having problems selling tickets in large masses. Um, and this has come over. Shout out to Moen Skin, Euro- Eurovision. Uh, check out our review. Yeah. But yeah, so that all has happened with Ticketmaster. Jeez. That is uh, the latest news. Well, I hope the monolith finally gets taken down, man. Me too. We've been yeah. railing hard, so yeah. There's your update. Um, I have some fun uh, music news. So the weekend song "Die for You," which was released six years ago, is now at number one thanks to a remix with Ariana Grande. This isn't the first time that we've seen this kind of thing. TikTok seems to just sort of be this thing that like it's this force that will push a song out and then everybody will use it on TikTok and then all of a sudden it's big again. Uh, we saw that. Mostly because of Stranger Things, but then it migrated over to TikTok with the Kate Bush song uh, and all that stuff. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Oh, that six years later, I want to. Cr- I feel like the first throwback Walk into in the, the sand. Oh, that was pretty big. I'm gonna go with uh, Rihanna with um, the 2020 pandemic uh, dog face 420 skateboarding down the street uh, to the Fleetwood Mac song, and that blew the Fleetwood Mac song. Oh, back oh yeah, up right, right, into right. Into the top ten. Yeah. So, oh, it was yeah. Dreams. Sorry, not Rihanna. It was Dreams. Yeah. 
Remember uh, that guy skateboarding he, to dreams? Yeah, and drinking the ocean spray. That went up to... Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. this is... But an, it's just funny how like something like TikTok can just bring a song back to life in that way, where all of a sudden it's just like, oh, this is the hot song because... So many, you know, like one person with a how many of her, you know, million subscribers and stuff or followers or whatever the TikTok thing is, you know, puts I'm the in. song out and all of a sudden it just goes rip right back up. So it's like at number one six years later. So that's pretty far out, man. So good for the weekend and Ariana Grande. I like this. It feels like power to the people a little bit getting to choose because the radio doesn't play what they want to hear. So they play what they want to hear in a way and yep. they get to choose what they like. Power to the algorithm. It is yeah. power to the algorithm in a weird way, yeah. but also p- someone got to choose that initially, you know? That's true. Yeah. So it feels like a little bit of a win, even though it's, it's still some kind of machinery that's mm-hmm. controlling our lives. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to that Gorillaz album from last week. <laughs> two, thumbs, <laughs> two thumbs down to TikTok virality. Yeah. Uh, any more music news, Jeffrey? No. Nope. Yo. Luca? <laughs> Here we go. Legal news. Real Earth, Wind, and Fire sues fake Earth, Wind, and Fire for trademark infringement. Um, So Earth, Wind, and Fire, you may have seen, just announced a new tour with Lionel Richie. Uh, Some of the members of Earth, and Wind, and Fire, the original members, are still with the band. That is Verdeen White and Philip Bailey, the original members of Earth, Wind, and Fire that tour as Earth, Wind, and Fire. There is another group called Earth, Wind, and Fire Experience. Our Legacy Reunion, that's what it is, Earth, Wind, and Fire Legacy Reunion, which claims to have former members of mm-hmm. Earth, Wind, and Fire, which has some kind of, like, side gig guys that played, like, a month or two with these people. <laughs> um, a month or two. <laughs> that's really what the situation is. And um, they are going around and touring as Earth, Wind, and Fire, and now Earth, Wind, and Fire is really touring with Lionel Richie, and the dates on all the websites to get Earth, Wind, and Fire tickets are all mixed up, so you can't tell if you bought tickets, uh, you know, to see yeah. real or fake Earth, Wind, and Fire. So things are getting very confused. Um, and they sued, claiming that they are, uh, tr- you know, representing them falsely and that they have no real members of Earth and Fire, which is true. They have no real members of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm. So um, that's interesting, and I thought that was uh, funny, and uh, it's like a band sues itself. It's almost like when Panic at the Disco broke up itself. They should just call themselves, what, like World Breeze and Flame, maybe. I well, they know. just need a to tribute to. Yeah, they Earth, just need to be fire. exactly. They need <laughs> to be know? pyramids, a tribute to Earth, Wind, Fire. Right? Yeah, something yeah, like that. Which is Earth, Wind, and Water. Oh, we're so different. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was. Uh, and Verdeen White and Villa Bailey, those are That's... out of the guys people knew in Earth, Wind, Fire. It was Maurice White, who was the band leader, one of the singers. Philip Bailey, the other singer, and Verdeen White, the bass player. Yeah. So because Verdeen White, he's like, I mean, with him, along with him, and uh, um, oh, what's his name? Uh crap. Graham Central Station, uh, Larry Graham. Sure, they're like the they're like the slap bass guys. Like if you ever oh, talk yeah. to like bass players and stuff, like they are the dudes, you know. Yeah, yeah so. they just need to be a tribute group. What do you guys know about Flea? Come on. Uh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, have like, some respect. The have some Flea respect. was Flea was Larry Graham's biggest influence. That's, huh. that's it. <laughs> that's what it was. He's, he's like, I gotta get me a tube sock. Um, anyway. Do we, have, do we have any more music news? I got bummer music news. All right, let's hear it. Let's go uh, for the bummers, then. Yo, so rest in peace to the concert goers that passed away at oh. the Glorilla concert in New yes, York. Yes, I see this. Um, they were crushed to death uh, when what was maybe a gunshot was heard to go off, allegedly, and uh, people panicked and rushed for the exits. Um, two are dead. Two are critically injured. And... You rest in peace to everybody that was, you know, hurt. Um, this is something that's happened at concerts before, and I just want to, you know, preach a little concert safety. And if you're going in a large space, know where your exits are and remain calm and yeah. slow and uh, concert etiquette. Um, also, guys, shout, you know, just really look out for one another at concerts. Um, I also saw some other things uh, pop up on the internet this week from a from a gig where somebody threw off a flare gun. Um, this was at the Playboy uh, Cardi set at the Rolling Loud Festival, and oh, somebody that, yeah. in the crowd was uh, breathing fire, which was very dangerous. And then a little later on during the set, somebody brought a flare, like we covered in the Iron Maiden concert. So um, just uh, now that phones are everywhere, there's a lot of crazy stuff that's getting filmed at concerts, and I think a lot of things are happening where some safety security measures should be implemented more before we have another uh, Woodstock 99 or what happened um, even last year where uh, people were crushed at that festival last year. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, concert etiquette, man. That's the thing. Um, and uh, concert promotion. You know, it needs to step up safety, and everybody needs to be uh, really, you know, it all needs to step up because it everyone involved. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a shame, but I just wanted to bring that up because it's a. Uh, yeah, it's, you know. well, it's important too, man. It is very important, you know. I mean, you go to metal shows. What's funny? Is the, I mean, for me, the, the one of the most shocking things was when I went to a metal show and a mosh pit comes through and somebody gets knocked down and and like they pick you back up. Like, sometimes, some yeah, sometimes, sometimes. At least, at least the ones that I went to. Depends where you're at. Yeah, depends where you're at. If it's so, a hate breed concert, maybe not. I just wanted to, uh, you know, bring yeah. that to people's light and attention, and um, very sad, but that yeah. was uh, what happened. So yeah. Uh, well, that about wraps up music news, I'm thinking, right? Yes. Okay, so onward to the next thing. Jeffrey, would you like to usher us in? Sure. This past Friday, March 3rd, was De La Soul Day. All of De La Soul's discography was available for the first time on streaming platforms. Hopefully you checked it out. Hopefully you bought some vinyl. If you are interested in De La Soul, one of the psychedelic hip-hop groups of the late 80s, early 90s was there height of popularity uh we listened to their debut album released on march 3rd in 1989 it is called three feet high and rising it's 24 tracks a bunch of skits and little interlude things it's about 67 minutes long a little over an hour long produced entirely by prince paul who was their de la soul's main collaborator for their first three albums um fun fact de la soul bringing in a different energy into hip hop, bringing a Long Island style, bringing kind of like a kid high school type of thing in because they were all so young. Maceo was 18 when this was released, so he was younger when recording. Paz was 19. Trugoy, who passed away a couple weeks ago, was 20. And Prince Paul was 21 when this was released. So these were a bunch of teenagers basically working on this record. Um, it's a very cool record. It's a ton of samples, uh, including artists such as Steely Dan, Hall & Oates, Billy Joel, Funkadelic, Kraftwerk, Wilson Pickett, The Turtles, Isley Brothers, Benny King, War, Steve Miller, Johnny Cash. Led uh, Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin, Otis Redding, Average White Band. Um, the list just goes on and on. Yeah, and that's kind of maybe why they hadn't had anything released until this point, because... There was so much sample clearance issues, and they didn't want to alter their songs and go back and re-record things or change up the beats. Um, so it's out now. What do you guys think about this record? I I personally was never big into De La Soul. I listened to their whole thing when they released it as a free download years and years ago. Um, but it's not something I go to regularly, but I enjoyed listening to this. Yeah, I, I would say about the same. Yeah, I mean, my, my immediate sort of reach when it comes to hip-hop uh, for people who are, you know, longtime listeners of the podcast know that uh, whenever I go, f whenever I reach for hip hop, my tendencies are much more along the lines of the Nas, Notorious B.I.G., Wu Tang, Mob Deep, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this was an interesting listen for me. I, you know, De La Soul was a blind spot, and I really do think that it it kind of is in part because of the fact that the music was so unavailable for such a long time. You know what I mean? It was like because ultimately it was uh, it, was, it was owned by Tommy Boy Records initially, and then that then the catalog got sold to Warner Brothers Music, and they didn't really do anything with that. Then it went back to Tommy Boy Records, and some time ago it was a whole thing where like, oh, it's coming back to streaming. Oh, that's cool. And then De La Soul had posted some news that basically said, yeah, the cut is ninety ten, meaning sure. Tommy Boy Records would get ten or ninety percent of the profits, and De La Soul would get. Uh, you know, yeah. So it was a crap deal. Uh, I ended up being sold again, and that's why we have it today. Um, but I think that was like a big factor as to why I probably like never really listened to De La Soul. But to be fair, I'm not a huge Tribe Called Quest guy either. And the, you know, they were all part of, um, they were all part of uh, the what was it called? Like the Native movement. Tongues. Thank you very much, Native Tongues with um, uh, Queen Latifah. It was a whole, it was a whole group of people that were involved in Jungle that. Jungle Brothers. Jungle Brothers. Uh, I have a couple. Uh, uh, Black Sheep. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Anyway, point being, uh, it was just never really like totally my style of, of hip hop. But I came to find that through listening to this album that I do enjoy in the sense that like if you consider sort of where they sit as far as hip hop goes, you know, this album was kind of labeled as like hip hop hippies, which I think was kind of a thing that they really didn't like, which is that why the next album is uh, De La Soul is Dead, right? Is the name yes. of the record. It has the, uh, the, Dead the Dead Daisy on it. On it. Um you know, like I said, it's not really my cup of tea, but then, you know, you come to realize that it is sort of that darkness and light thing, that sort of contrast that you get in hip hop. So although it is not really there as a first reach for me, 
Um, I respect it completely, and I did enjoy the record. I, I, I found it to be uh, a good listen. I am a giant Tribe Called Quest fan. I love De La Soul. This, this, uh, De La Soul was introduced to me even before Tribe Called Quest was. Um, I believe this is NCAA 2008. Um, had me, myself, and I on the soundtrack for the, uh, football game. So, um, I played that football game and got introduced to the song and was like, what's this band? What's it all about? And, um, could not really find a lot of information on it as to why, um, obviously the gorillas came out and you're like, oh, okay, that's that. Okay. And you make the connections there. But, um, this record, um, is my bread and butter. I really, really like this kind of hip hop. This is what I really go for. Um, I like that a lot of the songs aren't in the conventional um, what you would be like hearing at the time. There's a lot of funny wordplay that's like normal everyday life. Um, I'm going to even bring it back to like Brian Wilson kind of songwriting where you're writing about really basic uh, things that are going on in your day to day. Um, and these being like young 19 year olds, they're singing about things that they think are funny and um, and I really think that it resonates in a lot of ways. Also, the sampling on this record is top tier. It makes it fun and entertaining for me because all the songs are really groovy and they have things in it that make you laugh and smile. And it's done so well and it melds into this kind of um, like junky kind of feel where it's like loopy and like the Steely Dan sample is like slaggy and off tempo and it's really really groovy and it feels with the vibe of the record and it's my uh it's my thing i really enjoy this yeah, yeah. this was kind of like the dark ages of sample clearance because yeah. 1989 um 88 and 89 you had this record you had paul's boutique by the bc boys which is billions of samples you have the public enemy records which were billions of samples and it's kind of like the last time you could get away with like cut 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 collage it all together um but clearly it wasn't legal and that's why they were held up for so many years yeah. um i particularly enjoy the fact that the humor and the references on this album are and de la soul's larger discography is so like insular and it's like the jokes they have with each other or their friend group references that an outsider is like, what you have to go on rap genius to like find the meaning of all these things. Like, well, what are they even talking this, about this week? We're like, cause I'm blasting it in the car. Mike knows if I'm listening to a record on the morning, it means I really like it that we're going to talk about. And I'm listening to this record and we're listening to, uh, uh, Jennifer taught me. And, uh, Mike's like, what, what's, what is like a Jenny though? And I'm like, Oh, a Jenny's like a girl, you know, like, the, a babe like a yeah. betty and he's like oh and you know like i'm like and this is like that and that's this and there's like slang that goes along with mm -hmm. the entire insular jokes on jokes on jokes yeah and, and the skits yeah. are so weird <laughs> yeah but they're funny because they're like goofy it's like the kind of things you re would record with your friends if you were 19 years old uh R yeah like and game it, show it's, shit it's, and but just, it's so fun you know it's yeah. so fun to listen to yeah. You know, and like all the other things that would come afterwards, like your Illmatics and the Infamous and stuff like that, which is much more dark and brooding and sort of that cold sort of thing. This just feels so light and fun, and it you can hear that they're having fun while they're recording this record. Is this like the first hip hop like thematic skit through a record? It might be one of the first. I think ones it is possibly the first that, that has kind of continuous references to the skits right like yeah. i mean like and everybody would do this in the night like m those oh, m, &M yeah. records that have yeah. all like the th like they go yeah. from albums like you know different yeah, yeah. same people but notorious big would go on to do that stuff too right Kanye west wu tang yeah, all, yeah. um i love the one where he's like uh he's like uh i wish my cousin ned was here he knows these kind of things <laughs> <laughs> like, flips yeah. out. i just like that that makes me like although some of the skits are long too some of them are like <laughs> yeah. they're not really skits they're kind of like a minute and a half two minute long joke songs yeah uh, which, transmitting live from Mars, yeah, which is the turtle song with the French instructions. Oh to my do god, something. Dude, do you know how much I they got sued that. for the from by the turtles? <laughs> turtles like a by shit the done. fucking turtles, two point five didn't. million dollars. That was in 1991. So whatever the inflation this is, this isn't on a that. sample of the one turtle song people know. This is just yeah. another turtle song. Yeah, and, it, and they had cleared so much of the samples on this album already before yeah. that even happened. Um, yeah. 
speaking of like sampling rights and sh- and stuff, um, did you guys notice on this re-release on streaming that Otis Redding is uh, uh, credited yeah. credited as a, as a featured fe- artist on I Know for that whistle, even though the whole track is essentially Steely the Dan. Steely Dan song "Peg," yep. which is insane to that me. That whistle is forever. That's on every the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. So. It's really good. The whistle makes the whole song, yeah, yeah. but it's not the whole song. Right. You know, the whole song yeah, is pegged yeah, by Steely right. Dan, which is, it's just that blew my mind yeah. on this re release. Very funny. I, I also like you, we've been talking about how it's light and fun. It's light and fun, but there are some serious t- subject matter sure. songs oh, yeah, on sure. this. Um, a couple of my favorites actually on this record are a little bit more serious. Uh, Ghetto Thing, this is a recording for Living in a Full Time Era. Um, even like potholes in my lawn change and speak like they're they're kind of you know there's references to life in the inner city and the hard times people have growing up and prostitution and drug addiction and things like that um that were just realities of their life and experience and it's kind of like (coughs) there's lightness in the songs they don't get like dark heavy on these songs but they are being real about these subjects yes it's i think that you stated that really well like even some of like the backing tracks in those tunes are like kind of even like on ghetto thing is like it's a bit more like upbeat but they're like speaking about like serious things um i think uh flowers in our potholes in my lawn is a a really great song that does that because it's uh, it's more it's more subtle Mm -hmm. and has even some more like personal meanings as as it does outer meanings of like you know my property my things my but it also has the personal sentiment as well as like my life my person who i am um my de la soul if you will so i think it does that line really well if you're listening for it like it's all that and there's a lot of introspective things going on uh self you know self actuation that kind of thing in this album too and the messages are strong in there um i mean like the jungle brothers are in the posse and they are um you know very much in that and so is tribe called quest but um it fits in that whole thing i also think um out of like the first tribe called quest record too like the production on this like the beats are much better the rapping is much more there um even compared to like the first couple jungle brothers stuff where it's not so much like rapping i think this has like the flavor of it like full force uh right out of the box yeah some of the song highlights i love too uh the magic number of course that's i mean it's Mm -hmm. It's it's the one. It's and and again. That's the one for you, huh? No, 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 I'm saying. Well, I mean, it's the first. It's the first track, right? It's the first after track. the skit. Yeah. After the skit, yeah. Um, I do love that. I love that track. Yeah. I uh, like. I love. So much jo- <laughs> I love Johnny Cash at the end saying, "How high is the water, Mama?" Like that's great. That's so cool to just yeah. be like, "Here's a hip hop band like putting a hip hop group putting Johnny Cash in," which is great. And also, uh, uh they sample Schoolhouse Rock. Mm-hmm. Which is over, another thing where you're like over John Bonham's famous drum beat, right? So it's just like it's one of those things where you're like, oh, holy shit! Like, what is going on here? Um, plug tune in. I do love that too, where it breaks into chopsticks. That's always fun. Oh um, no, that's Jennifer. No, that, that's Jen, uh, Jenny taught me. I what? thought that brought. I thought that was the one that broke into chopsticks. Oh, no, no, no right, Jennifer right, taught right. me is chopsticks. Yeah. Anyway, so yes, that's what I meant to say. Is <laughs> that one? Um, the My cutting, apologies. The cutting on uh, Jenny yeah, taught me too is yeah. some of the like best cutting I've ever heard on right. Like, chop, 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 yeah, chop, yeah. chop, is like blows my mind. I love that shit so much. Um, also, yeah. I don't know. Is that the same drum break in the verse as um, Bell Biv DeVoe's um, Poison? It sounds the same to me. I don't know if it is. Somebody get at me in the comments. Also, we were listening to that song too. That verse deconstructs itself, like in samples. It like adds. It mm-hmm. has full samples. Takes something away, and then takes something away, and then hits the chorus. Mm. It's so masterfully produced. Yeah. Any other favorite songs for you, Mike? Uh, a little bit of soap. I like that one too. The Benny King. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Oh, that's like good <laughs> a little skit song. song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I dig that. And then, I mean, I, you know, I know me, myself, and I is one of those songs, but I mean, it's a classic tune. You know, you kind of, uh, I'll tell you what I wasn't a huge fan of, and it's not even really a song, De La Orgy. I was kind of like, okay, I don't really know about this one. I thought you like Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> I do. I don't and like those le- either. And I don't then it like leads, leads into Buddy, which is the song about them picking up girls. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, that's the one with yeah, Q-Tip and Jungle Brothers, yeah. Also, uh, Buddy, guys, is like the only, one of the only Native Tongues posse tracks that ever exists. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's of note, too, on this record, because they never, re- I mean, they did in some forms, but they never got together that much with, like, Jungle Brothers, De La Soul, and yeah. Q-Tip. Yeah, my favorites are um, Jennifer Taught Me, uh, definitely my favorite song. Um I know, which is the Steely Dan sample song. Say No Go, which is the Hall and Oates sample song. Oh yeah, yeah. Ghetto Thing, which like I said is one of the more gritty tracks. Um and this is a recording for Living in a Full Time Era, which has some kind of weird like s- dark synth thing going on in the background. Um but yeah, those are my five favorite. But I loved this whole album. Like after listening to it and listening to it and listening to it and like giving myself over to like you don't typically listen to this, but like just listen to it a fourth time. Um, even yeah, all the skit songs for the most part I even got into because they aren't they're like they are songs with skits over them. They're still like interesting samples and stuff in the mm. background. They aren't just like we're over here making crank phone calls. Like yeah, they right. were still kind right. of songs. Yeah, I uh, I like that the skits were like moving when they were moving, and then you have the game show skit that really like goes through the whole record. But um, all the ones you guys shouted out, I mean, I added in my ad libs. I'm like, I'm I'm a ten for ten on this record. This is like my butter on here. So um, I really like every song in here. I like the whole sound collage of it, the feeling of it. Um, and I I, I get in I get into the whole the whole thing of it. I yeah. really really. There's like not one song in this record where I'm like I don't like this. I like every song in this record. Yeah. Um, shout out to one we didn't talk about. Uh, Daisy Age, the last song. Uh. You know, just it's a Daisy Age. I really like the whole concept of this too. Um, I like how the record is themed as it's the Daisy Age. It's they're bringing flowers. Um, they're filling the potholes in their life in their lawn with flowers. Um, and whatever that means to you, um, that's what that means to you. But I think it's a really interesting statement, and I think it's very artfully done. And like Jeff said, for such young people to have put this record out in such a stylized um it's so crazy how young they were yeah image and Jeez. feel and it's just so masterfully done um and yeah like i said to death it's uh, a really great record yeah um favorite samples before we go like the favorite sample on here that like drives you nuts that you can't get enough of because i thought that was uh I, I, I mean, I like the Benny King, man. The Benny King sample? I think sample? Benny King is it for me. I think that's my favorite one on the whole one. I think it's Treadwater that has like that like 60s organ, maybe. It's either that or Pot Holes My Lawn. I can't remember which of the two has like that pretty organ-y thing with like kind of horn hits. Um, but also, I do like the Hall & Oates thing on Say No Go. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah. so good the hollow notes yeah. is is really really well done um i'm gonna go to the one the i'm just gonna say it's the otis redding whistle for me oh <laughs> yeah. uh, i know that whistle's so good isn't it uh, when mike pointed it out that to me that was otis redding i was like yeah. oh my god it's the otis redding whistle oh it's so brilliant oh it's yeah. so good uh, <laughs> Alex, so loud in the mix what you got can we get ratings from mike and Jeff? oh yes oof you want to do the honor? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go. Yeah, be honest. I mean, yeah, the I'll, honorist. I think it's an eight. Yeah, I think it's an eight. I think it's uh it's it, it proves its worth every time you listen to it. Sure, it's not the first thing that I reach for, but as far as hip hop albums go, and the influence that it had, and kind of like where it sits uh, between the birth of hip hop and then where hip hop would go in the nineties, it's an eight for me. Yeah, I um before listening to it a bunch this week this was like a seven or an eight uh after listening to it a bunch today on a nice sunny day this is a nine for me yeah yeah so we have an eight a nine and i'm gonna go ten on ten. this one. Oh my god is this two consecutive no well this is a classic this is a classic is release a classic. so i guess it's it doesn't classic. like account as much for and that i can't wait to listen to De-, De la soul is dead again blue minds day again stakes is high again those are the the first four are the ones that i enjoy the most yeah alex yeah uh I want to say also this is about a nine for me. I'm big in a tribe called Quest, Far Side, Gangstar, like a lot of that style of, of stuff. And I had never listened to De La Soul prior to you guys talking about it. Um, and I listened to this album front to back probably like three times. Yeah. So I was really pleased with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, right there on, you have Alex. it, folks. Make sure to stream it if you can stream it. Make sure to buy it if you have the ability to buy it. 
let's get De La Soul. Yeah, leave it back playing on there. your phone. Um, I just want to also point out that there's a few million streams on Three's The Magic Number, which was released a couple weeks ago. Um, and there's a couple million streams on I Know. Um, so get the whole album up to a couple million streams and make it in the top ten again, because I think that yeah. should be uh, that would be a goal that would be really cool to do for De La Soul, and they deserve it. So yeah, a hundred percent. It would be really cool if you know maybe for music news in like a week or so's time, if we say you know we kind of see like what the weekend did, where it's like a song uh, is back in the charts. You know, yeah, like, it'd, it'd be really cool. Yeah, it'd be really cool to see. So there you have it, folks. It was a short episode this week, but. I hope you liked it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that stuff, and uh, tell your local lunch person. <laughs> yeah, someone that serves you lunch. Someone that serves you lunch. At your school or college or your workplace. Yeah, wherever you go. The cafeteria person. So uh, until next time, guys, something to get in the garage. Love, peace, hair grease.